Legend has it that many years ago, a prominent businessman told Mark Twain, before I die, I intend to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I want to climb to the top of Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments aloud. To which Mr. Twain replied, I've got a better idea. Why don't you stay right at home in Boston and keep them? <laughs> Let's take a closer look at that idea. Toward the end of 2023, Jean and I were in the city of Athens, and one afternoon we decided to visit the other half of the Acropolis, where there's a beautiful park just opposite of the Parthenon. What I wanted to see was a cave that's been labeled Socrates' prison, even though there's almost zero chance that the great philosopher was actually ever in there. It's a small cave in the hillside, and you can see these little holes where there used to be wooden beams anchored into the rock because... Well, there used to be a house in front of the cave. Now, when we got there, there was this guy standing in front of one of the cave openings, and he was streaming something over his phone, live streaming. So, of course, I had to wait to take a picture because I didn't want this guy in my shot. And as I was waiting, I got a little closer so I could listen to what he was saying. I thought maybe he was some kind of historian or an archaeologist, and I was eager to find out if he might be telling the truth about the history of that cave. I mean, it kind of looks like a little prison, but that's because the Greeks were using it during World War II to hide valuable artwork from the Nazis who were in the habit of plundering, and they put bars in the opening. But imagine my surprise when I found out this live streamer was not a historian. He wasn't even a tourist. He was a psychic of some kind, and he was telling his audience that he felt a lot of psychic energy radiating from the cave because, of course, he believed this was the spot where one of history's most famous people was forced to commit suicide by drinking poison. This is where Socrates died, he said, and he was pretty excited. You should feel the energy coming out of this place. And you know, for half a moment, I thought about telling him that Socrates didn't actually die in there, but I guess I was being entertained enough that I didn't want to stop the show. I figured I could look up the video later and leave the truth in his comments so his followers could see that he was just one more psychic charlatan deceiving people, presumably, for their money. But alas, I failed to find his video after the fact, and so I guess he succeeded in perpetuating his lie for one more day. But just in case somebody listening might have seen this guy online somewhere, I figured I'd mention this because far too many people buy the absolute baloney that these so-called psychics are selling. The odds that this guy was channeling the ghost of Socrates? Zero. It didn't happen. And as a minister, I should probably add that the Bible itself denies that possibility. Not only did God expressly forbid such things, but the scriptures also state quite plainly that contact with the dead is impossible. Let me show you from the Old Testament book of Job, where the Bible says, as the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol, that's the Hebrew word for the grave, does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does his place know him anymore. Now, if that's not clear enough, listen to this passage from Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It says, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. Now, the last time I checked, Socrates would have to know something to communicate with a psychic. It continues. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. So, here's the thing. Mr. I Can Channel Socrates was standing directly beneath the sun when he made his video, which means that from the Bible's perspective, whatever he was feeling at that moment, not the ghost of Socrates. But enough about the psychic, because what I really want to talk about is the reason Socrates was killed. The powers that be in those days considered him a horrible influence on the young because he was questioning the traditional religious belief of Athens. To use the words that Plato put in Socrates' mouth, he was accused of, quote, creating new gods while not believing in the old gods. Now, what Socrates was actually guilty of was raising questions about the behavior of the Greek gods. 
right after a good friend of his mentions that Zeus had to punish his father for eating his own children, Socrates tells him he found it, quote, hard to accept things like that being said about the gods. And then he asks a really important question. Let me just read that to you. Socrates says, and do you believe that there really is war among the gods and terrible enmities and battles and other such things as are told by the poets and other sacred stories such as are embroidered by good writers and by representations of which the robe of the goddess is adorned when it is carried up to the Acropolis? Are we to say these things are true, Euthyphro? <laughs> Based on the records left behind by Plato, some people accused Socrates of atheism because he was asking some really penetrating questions about the Greek pantheon. Now, I'm not at all convinced that he was an outright atheist who believed in no gods because Plato, a keen disciple of Socrates, did believe in a supreme being. What Socrates was actually doing was appealing to reason as a way to build a good civilization instead of some of the ridiculous stories that hailed from Mount Olympus. The behavior of the Greek gods, he pointed out, was awful. They were petty, murderous, capricious, licentious, and that's because they were made in the image of fallen human beings instead of the other way around. They were human inventions. To put it bluntly, their behavior was way beyond embarrassing, and a thinking person would be hard-pressed to use the stories of these pagan gods to build an ethical system of living. I mean, the gods could scarcely get along with each other, so how in the world are they going to teach us to live in peace? And wouldn't you know it? Socrates was hardly alone in this conviction. We also have the rather fascinating example of Xenophanes. I've mentioned him before, I'm pretty sure. And Xenophanes taught that the gods were poorly behaved because they were invented by us, poorly behaved human beings. And he also said that the nature of the universe points to the existence of just one god who by nature has to be morally superior to us. Otherwise, what's the point? So one of the reasons that paganism collapsed when Christianity came to town is because the pagan gods were so immoral. I mean, it's not the only reason by a long shot, and the story's a little more complex than that. But the fact that these pagan gods from all the various Western cultures behave so abysmally is well beyond dispute. All you have to do is pick up a book of ancient myths and you'll see it for yourself. And personally, I think there's something really fascinating about the way that these pagan deities supposedly interacted with human beings. What you never seem to find is any kind of clear moral code being given to us. All we really have is the work of human philosophers who tried to cobble together lessons about politics or ethics occasionally mentioning stories about the gods, but for the most part, they just appealed to bare human reason. All right, time for a quick break, so I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. The gods of the Greeks and Romans were a rather unpleasant collection of badly behaved deities. And to say that these gods actually loved humanity is laughable because their behavior said otherwise. I mean, take a look at the popular story of Prometheus, who angered the gods by giving us fire. He was punished severely for that supposed crime. He was tied to a rock, and every day, Zeus would send an eagle to pick him open and eat his liver while he was still alive. Overnight, his liver would grow back, and the next day, and every day thereafter, the eagle would do it again, and again, and again, and that was supposed to go on for all eternity. So, honestly, it's not that hard to see why some pagans started to believe that the gods must hate us. And in time, there were philosophers who agreed with them. The gods were horrible beings whose sense of morality was actually worse than ours. But then compare that story to the story you find in the Bible, where it's not the Creator who behaves badly, it's, it's us. If anything, the God of Abraham is unbelievably patient, and instead of acting arbitrarily, He's got a rock-solid moral character you can always count on. He doesn't leave us guessing as to the basics of right and wrong, which is what the Greek philosophers had to figure out for themselves. 
I mean, most of Plato's work was really just ethical guesswork based on rational arguments. And while it makes for some really interesting reading, and he certainly was right about some things, it's just philosophical speculation, and it lacks any guidance from the so-called gods. By contrast, the god of scripture actually writes a brief moral code on tables of stone and then hands them to a prophet on Mount Sinai. And I guarantee you know this code because, well, it's the Ten Commandments. Morality in the Bible is a top-down affair, which makes skeptics think it's the work of some kind of cosmic dictator who's just trying to ruin our fun. They think it's just some arbitrary list of rules from another capricious pagan-style deity. But there's nothing even remotely arbitrary about the Ten Commandments. In fact, they are anchored in the very character of God himself. The commandments exist because God exists. Now, that might be one of the most important things we're going to look at, because the way a lot of people think about God's moral law, it's just a set of rules designed to control us. And from that perspective, any set of rules would be about the same. It's just about control. You can make a law, for example, that all males over the age of 50 are required to tattoo a rhinoceros on the left side of their head or face the death penalty. And humanly speaking, they think that would be just as valid as the commandment against adultery, because it's just a matter of making your inferiors toe the line. But that's not at all what's happening with the Bible's moral law. In fact, if you examine it, you begin to realize there are no alternatives. There is no other law because the commandments are a reflection of God himself. It's not arbitrary because there's nothing arbitrary about God. I mean, have you ever wondered why the penalty for sinning seems so severe? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And the way some people respond to that, you'd think that the God of the Bible is just like the gods of Mount Olympus. Ignore their demands or cross them and they'll kill you. It's a matter of ego or personal pride. But with the moral law you find in the Bible, it's something else entirely. If the law is actually a reflection of God's own character, and you and I choose to defy it, we're actually living an inauthentic life because we're deliberately separating ourselves from the one and only source of life in this universe. From the Bible's perspective, sin is not just a matter of breaking some rules, it's more a matter of compromising your own ability to live. Maybe one of the best ways to think about it is like this. According to the Bible, God's chief defining characteristic is love. Now, not the sentimental sloppy kind you find in modern rom-coms, but everlasting principled love, a love that always does what's right even when that means personal inconvenience. And when that perfectly loving God first set this universe in motion, he stood back, looked at what he made, and said, It is very good. He made that pronouncement after the creation of human beings, because that week, we were God's crowning achievement. And because God is love, that meant we were also made for love. In fact, one of the first things you find in the Bible is the institution of marriage, where a husband and wife are said to be one person. That's a dim reflection of God's own character, because as you read the rest of the Bible, you discover there's just one God, but he's three persons in one God. The book of Genesis says we were made in God's image, which means that you and I were supposed to be a demonstration of God's goodness and glory. If somebody watches us, at least the way we used to be, they should be able to learn something about the character of the one who made us. And in order to demonstrate love, we had to be free. Because if you can't choose not to love, well, in that case, love becomes kind of meaningless. So in the beginning, we really wouldn't have needed a handwritten, transcribed copy of God's law because it was just a natural part of our own makeup. But then we made the wrong choice. And from that point forward, our lives actually became a lie about the one who made us. We became self-serving, self-interested, and incredibly selfish. And now someone could watch us and blame God for the horrible things we do. I mean, just take a moment and think of all the times you've heard critics scoff at the church because of the way the members behave. That's what your God is like? He caused you to do that? And sometimes they kind of have a point because our behavior is not always a good reflection of who God is. But the Ten Commandments are that reflection and they don't change. After the fall, 
God had to retrain us. He had to commit his moral code to writing so that we could hold it up like a mirror and examine our moral selves. I mean, maybe you've wondered when the Bible says that all of us fall short of the glory of God, how exactly you're supposed to know how far you've fallen. The answer is simple. The glory of God is on full display in his moral law. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4 verse 8 that God is love. And wouldn't you know it? The book of Romans describes his moral law the same way. Just listen to this description found in Romans chapter 13, where it says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now, some modern Christians are going to insist for whatever reason that Christian love has somehow replaced God's law. And they'll tell you it's because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And they say, look, because of that, the moral law is no longer in force. Its only purpose, they say, was to prove that sinful human beings cannot live up to God's standards. I mean, I remember visiting this guy more than 25 years ago, and he was agitated about this idea that God might actually require obedience. What we have now instead of the law, he told me, is grace. And of course, that's kind of true. Our salvation can't be earned by working for it. Your transgression against God's holiness is way too big for you to be able to fix it by paying spiritual reparations. When it comes to salvation, there is no time off for good behavior. And I'll be right back after this quick break to tell you why. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. Let's suppose you're in court being tried for murder and there's no question you're guilty. In fact, the jury deliberates for less than three minutes because your guilt is that obvious. And now let's suppose when it comes time to make a personal statement right before sentencing, you tell the judge, listen, your honor, if you let me go, I promise never to murder anybody ever again. Cross my heart, hope to die. Now, you and I both know full well that judge is not going to pardon you based on the promise of future good behavior. After all, not killing people is baseline good behavior that we expect from everybody. It doesn't earn you special privileges. So promising to do right is not going to fix your guilt because you have already violated the social covenant in the worst way possible. Likewise, good behavior in the eyes of God will not solve the reality that your life has already been a denial of God's goodness. I mean, let's just be honest. As a known creature of God, your life has been a lie about who he is and what he's like. And even more to the point, if you get a pardon that you didn't deserve, which is what the cross made available, that does not mean that you now have a lifetime exemption from living in harmony with God. To suggest that grace is some kind of moral hall pass that exempts you from the requirements of the moral law, which again is entirely based on God's own character, well, let's just say that it makes a mockery out of the high price that Christ had to pay in order to save you. To put it simply, God's grace is not a license for bad behavior. In fact, it's entirely the opposite. There's a passage in the book of Romans that some people find a little confusing because it seems to imply that the grace of God has somehow nullified the requirements of his moral law. Here's what it actually says in Romans 6.14. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Now, at first glance, that appears to say that Christians are free to ignore the moral law because we are now living under grace. But the only way you can make it say that is to willfully ignore the context. I mean, just listen to what Paul says a few verses earlier in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? In other words, if grace is good, then just get busy sinning so you can have more grace. 
What shall we say then, he continues, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And then we have this statement down in verse 15, just one verse after Paul's statement that we're no longer under the law but under grace. And listen very carefully to what he actually says. And I'm going to read a bit of this because this is really important. He writes, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Take the time sometime to read the whole chapter. In fact, read the whole book of Romans, and I think it'll become obvious. Salvation by grace through faith does not entitle us to do away with the moral law. I mean, that's what got us into trouble in the first place. What we have in the Ten Commandments is a picture of what it means to live an authentic human life, the kind of life that God intended before we exercised our moral free will and decided to compromise his whole creation. Which brings me back to the point I made at the top of the show. Where the gods of Mount Olympus failed to give us a codified moral law, the God of Abraham did. What we have in the Bible is a moral God, and that's a very welcome departure from the gods of the pagans. But there's still something deep inside of us that chafes at the notion that we might be accountable to somebody. So here's what I want you to think about, because there's something really simple that evades our notice when we're busy squirming in the face of God's moral law. What would you rather have? An amoral God? One who doesn't care about right and wrong? Or even worse, would you rather have an immoral God who does the wrong thing, like so many of the half-baked deities of the Greeks and Romans? Would you really want a God who isn't moral? What we have in the Ten Commandments is incredibly good news. If God is real, and I believe He is, then finding out that He has moral expectations and He cares about the way you live, how in the world would that be a bad thing? I'm reminded of Jesus' famous summary of the law found in Matthew chapter 22. This happened when a lawyer tried to test the limits of Jesus' moral teaching. And here's what he asked Jesus. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, there is no unimportant commandment in the Decalogue because it's all a description of God's essential nature, and that essential nature is love. In the first table, we find a description of how we express our love for God. Then in the second table, we find the commandments related to things like murder, theft, and adultery, and it's a summary of our duty to each other. God is love, the Bible tells us, and He explains how we can follow suit and live as if we were really made in His image. All right, time for one last break. So I'll be right back after this. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888 456 7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. 
Okay, I've probably blabbed on long enough, which I do every single week. But before I stop, let me say this. I honestly believe that some people wish that God's moral requirements didn't exist because of the pain they feel when they realize just how unlike God we really are. Our behavior doesn't line up with what we find in the commandments. The commandments, the Bible explains, are like a mirror that shows us our real condition. It reveals that we aren't the best example of what it means to be made in the image of God. In fact, some days it looks like the complete opposite. And that's a realization that can take you in one of two directions. On the one hand, you can allow your pride to get the better of you. You can smash the mirror, so to speak. You can decide that maybe your personal violations of God's moral code really aren't that serious at all. They're not all that bad. Maybe there's something wrong with the law itself. That's one direction that you can take, and many people do. In fact, I think most people take that direction. But then on the other hand, you could acknowledge the gravity of the situation. You could admit how bad it is. You could admit how far you do fall short of that moral standard, and then accept the incredible forgiveness and mercy that God's offering to you. You can celebrate the fact that you have a moral God who doesn't change, and He cares about you. And even though you and I have violated His trust in the worst possible way, I mean, not only did we break His law and turn our backs on Him, we ultimately even murdered His Son at the cross. Somehow, He still remains interested in helping you recapture the joy of living an authentic human life. 3,000 years ago, the psalmist wrote these words in Psalm 119. He said, Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Some people say that the commandments are a recipe for oppression and death, but the Bible says just the opposite. Sometimes it really does pay to conform. It really does pay to color inside the lines, to live by the rules. Because the final picture, when you do that, is all the more beautiful. When you and I color outside of the lines, when we decide we want to be independent and we want to break free from any authority that God might have over our lives, ask yourself this. At the end of the road, every time you've done that, how's it turned out? When you're trying to take the reins of your own life and run the show yourself, how well does that go? Maybe it's time to pick up a Bible to take a look at what God said. It's just 10 rules. It's not 600. It's not 1,000. It's 10. I challenge you. I dare you. Take a look at them and ask yourself, does this make sense? And could this possibly be the path to a more authentic, a more contented life? If you have trouble getting started on your studies, go to BibleStudies.com and we're quite happy to help you get started with completely free resources. Thanks for joining me this week. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been another episode of Authentic. Hey, would you help us out? Click that like button, subscribe, and then drop a comment. That, by far, is the easiest way to help more people watch Authentic. It takes just a few seconds, it's free, and it helps Authentic reach people who are interested. So go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks.